On uh, April the 16th and 17th, we'll host our candidate forum. It'll be at the Berkeley County Commission Chamber meeting room on the second floor. That's the 16th and 17th, 8 until noon, roughly, for both of those days. And on the first day, between 8 and 9, we'll feature uh, three of the four candidates who are running for governor. One of those is Secretary of State Mac Warner, who joins us via telephone right now. Mac, good morning. How are you, sir? Good morning. I would think anybody that could handle an overflowing moat would be Admiral Stubblefield. <laughs> <laughs> you would think, right? It's just, it's been a while. He's well prepared for that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he just has Bonnie get the dinghy and she rows him to safety <laughs> if the water gets too high. Uh, Mac, uh, in uh, the last week or so, I think we interviewed uh, Tony Petrucci, the Berkeley County Clerk. He praised your office uh, for its efficiency and uh, cooperation in helping to set up things here in Berkeley County, where we are now are going to have three early voting uh, locations for the May 14 primary, which is a relief to many people in this area. Uh, Mac, perhaps you could uh, lay out the differences between the state's job as the Secretary of State with elections versus the county clerk's job and responsibilities, because I think some people might not be clear on that. The uh, <clears throat> role of the um county clerks is to actually run the elections. Uh, I think that's somewhat of a uh, – people think of me as the chief elections officer, which I am. I have that title. But my job is really to support those county clerks in doing their job. So, uh, for example, we just had a number of legislative uh, initiatives that passed, and so we will be teaching the clerks what was passed, what is to be implemented, and that sort of thing. It's our job to support them with, say, helping to get uh, poll workers. So we're talking on the radio – on shows such as this and saying, if you're interested in being a poll worker, please come to our website. You can go to the county clerk and go to your executive committee. But typically, the easiest thing is to go to the Secretary of State's website, sign up to be a poll worker, and then we get that information to the, the clerks. But perhaps behind the scenes, the most important thing is what the people of West Virginia elected me to do, and that was to clean up the voter registration lists. And so since I've been in office, we've taken off 400,000 names. That's how dirty or bloated the roles had gotten. And so when we get that information, we pass out to the county clerks. They are verified. They are the ones who actually take the names off the list. But it's that cooperative effort between the two of us, our two offices, that enable us to, uh, that have enabled us to make West Virginia the model for the rest of the nation in running clean, fair, clean elections. So um, that's kind of the, the difference in the roles is mine is supportive of the county clerks who are actually doing the actual elections. Mac, I, you know, I understand, by the way, that Berkeley County poll workers got a raise recently. They'll be doing, I think, $300 for that. That's controlled by the counties, not the states, correct? That is correct. There's some effort to try to stabilize that or you know, make it uniform. But the different counties have different uh, budgets and wherewithal to, uh, to pay their poll workers differently. So I think you're going to be one of the highest, if not the highest, in the state. But you're also the largest, and or you know one of the largest, and very busy, uh, active counties. So, uh, again, that's up to the county commissions, and I'm happy that uh, they're able to do that. And with that uh, sort of compensation, you probably don't have the trouble of getting the poll workers that some of the other counties do. It's a, it's a nice amount of money there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are Mike Queen sent me this information to to pass along. One thousand six hundred ninety one precincts will be open statewide on May fourteen election day. 8,400-plus poll workers, 1,780 federal, state, county, and local candidates on the ballot. Uh, almost 450,000 voters participated in the 2020 presidential primary election, 212,000 voted Republican. And April 23rd is the last day to register to vote or update your current registration if you moved or changed your name. Mac, how do you update your voter registration? Again, you can go to our website, uh, GoVoteWV.com. You can go in and see the county clerk. You can call in and uh, talk with them, get specific information. The county clerks typically have websites as well. So the main thing is simply to call or contact somebody in the elections arena, your county or here at the Secretary of State's office, and we will direct you. And, of course, you can go online. You can even do it on your cell phone. Go to the GoVoteWV.com, put in your information, and update it right there. How do you get an absentee ballot, and how do you qualify to receive an absentee ballot? The legislature has given about 11 reasons why you can vote absentee. You know, if you're in the military, of course, if you're going to be out of state uh, on business, those sorts of things, if you're in the hospital, there are 11 specific reasons, and you have to check one of those boxes. boxes. We are not a no-excuse absentee voting 
state, we're one of about 16 states where you have to cite a reason. And I think that provides some security, some um, uh, rationale for voting absentee so we just don't get into the situation where we're mailing out ballots to everybody and that sort of thing. That's kind of the no-excuse situation. And again, that I think is what has caused West Virginia to be at the top of the list nationwide in voter uh, integrity and election security. So you do that by, again, you can go online to govotewv.com. You can call your county clerk. You can go in and see the county clerk and make fill out that application and send it in. Very good. And uh, early voting this year is uh, going to be May 1 to May 11. Election day is May 14. And uh, otherwise, uh, when is the last day to register to vote, Mac? That's uh, April 23rd. April 23rd. All right, let's talk about your campaign a little bit here. And uh, as I said, three of the four of you running uh, main candidates running for office in the Republican primary will be appearing at our debate uh, or forum, as the case may be. Uh, Attorney General Patrick Morrissey will not be. In fact, I've heard he's pulled out of just about every one of these forums around the state. Mac, are you getting any inside information as to why that's happening? Well, and there was some poor performance on his part in that first debate. He was asked questions he didn't like to have to answer. And so uh, he's trying to do the Joe Biden thing, and it's hide in his basement, stay away from the voters. He wants, he's wants. he got this $10 million from this group called Club for Growth. It's an anti-Trump group. And so he's hiding behind the slick postcards that I think everybody's probably been receiving in their mail, uh, letting the uh, you know the, the, the paid consultants do his advertising or propaganda for him. So... He's running from the voters, hiding from the voters, doesn't want to answer the tough questions. And so uh, that's why we're changing these or people are changing to forums rather than debates. He doesn't like answering the tough questions. So uh, I think the voters will see through that. I hope the Republican Party understands what's going on here. And uh, so I'm looking forward to it. I, I enjoy talking with people like you, uh, the moderators. I enjoy talking with people and answering the questions. Because that's how people can compare and contrast the candidates and decide who they want to uh, be leading the state and who they'll be listening to for the next four or even eight years. Uh, they want somebody who's experienced, who's not afraid to address the tough questions. And, uh, you know, the people elected me to do a job as Secretary of State, I think the results are right there. We've just been talking about the clean elections and so on. Uh, I just want to take that experience that I have and move it to the next level as governor and accomplish the same thing across state government as I've done in the Secretary of State's office. Matt Miller. Mac, thank you so much for joining us. I, I want to go back just briefly to uh, your hat right now as the Secretary of State and, and ask a question about the absentee ballots and, and those being mailed out. Um, if I uh, ask for an absentee ballot, I meet one of those 11 requirements, that ballot comes to me, does that get marked in some way so that on election day I don't show up at my precinct and try to then place a vote on that day as well? You can still show up and, and vote, and then it becomes a question for the uh, county commission as they do the polling, the, the canvassing, which occurs six days after the election, as to which uh, ballot would uh, prevail. So if you vote, uh, the poll workers would say, well, this is a provisional ballot because you have it should be marked that you've already voted an absentee ballot. Uh, that's why that, that cutoff 21 days prior gives those clerks the time to, one, get you the absentee ballot if you've requested it. That You have up till six days prior to the election to request that absentee ballot, but the registration occurs 21 days prior. But those, those deadlines give the clerks time to uh, put that information into the poll books uh, when you cast that absentee ballot or voting in person. That is marked as you've already voted. So again, when you show up on election day, if you try to vote that second time, they mark it as provisional. And then the county commission would decide which of the two votes uh, would count. If you had some reason why that first vote shouldn't count and you explain that to them, and you, uh, that's a decision that is made at that point. Obviously, that 2020 election was unique um, from any other election. How much have you seen from that election up until now? Is the absentee ballot and even the early voting becoming more popular, say, than showing up on an election day and voting at the polls? The one side has used that nationwide to try to push H.R. 1, which was let's nationalize the elections. Let's tell everybody that we're just going to mail out ballots, use absentee or vote by mail and so on. But 
everybody understands that that's the most insecure form. That's that's where most of the cheating occurs is with mail-in ballots and so on. So uh, we have not seen a huge push here in West Virginia for that. Uh, people like to vote in person on Election Day here. Just to give you some of the numbers, that 2020 election was abnormal in that we sent the ballots out. If you recall, the primary was actually moved from May until June because of COVID. West Virginia was just spiking at that moment with the COVID uh, related uh, incidences. So that's why we went to a lot of the voting by mail, but they quickly returned by the general election, like in the primary, I think 240,000 or so votes were cast by mail. But by the general election, that had gone down into the 100,000. And then by the 2020 election, we'd gone back to about 12,000 absentee ballots. And typically prior to that, we only had about 7,000 absentee ballots uh, voted in the state. So you can see our numbers quickly went right back down to close to where they have been traditionally. And I think uh, Rob may have mentioned this uh, primary season. We just started sending out absentee ballots on Friday. We only had 1,187 requests for absentee ballots. Now, I'm sure more will come in, but I think we're going to be back into that seven to 12,000 range for this election, which is not a huge number uh, in the overall scheme of things. How have you seen the participation in voting rise in the state of West Virginia? More and more people getting out and exercising their right. It seems so many times when we go through an election, we get finished and go, you know, a very small minority of those who live in the state actually are the ones that are making decisions by going out and casting votes. It's true. There, the problem is there's so many variables in these um, elections. And so, for example, you typically don't have near the number in the primary that you do in the general election. And then in a case like this year, you would think that there might be a large turnout. But if you look at the presidential election or the presidential nominations, those have already been decided. Trump's going to be the Republican nominee and Biden's going to be the Democrat nominee. And so you really don't have a driving force at the presidential level to get people out. Uh, you can take a look at the Senate race. And if you were to believe the polls, uh, you know, that is, is skewed one, in one direction. And so it's really the down ballot races. Or the, is there enough interest in the governor and the, in the state Senate, the House and so forth to drive people to the polls? Now, one encouraging thing is, as you heard, uh, there are – let me see. It was 1,780 candidates on the ballots, and so that's a lot of people with their family and friends to get people to the polls. So you really have these uh, the, the push and the pull as to what's driving people to the polls. Is it is it specific races? Is it personalities? Is it party issues and so on? We've we've gone so far to the right here in West Virginia. The Republicans are dominating the uh, elections now. Is that going to drive people to the poll either for Republicans or Democrats? trying to push back, or is it going to be a fait accompli and people to stay home because they think the decisions have already been made? That remains to be seen. So uh, I don't have a good answer for you, just knowing that um, it's hard to predict trends because there's so many variables as these races have uh, come to come into focus, uh, whether people re will respond to that or not. And just quickly throw in, don't ever, if you were a voter, just assume something is already done. You have a right. Go cast your vote for whomever it is that you want to vote for, whether you think they will win or won't win or something is already said or done. I just I don't get it. You have that right. Go exercise that right. John Gilstrap. Good morning, Mac. Nice to talk to you. Uh, West Virginia is such a red state. So it occurs to me, particularly on, on the, the state level uh, elections, whoever wins the primary is essentially going to win the whoever wins the primary for, for the governor's race is going to become the governor. So if you win, um, unless something truly unexpected happens, the, the governor's mansion is yours uh, in, in, the, in the November election, which gives you an extraordinary seven month period to start planning your legislative agenda to to kick off your administration uh, what are what what is the top five things in your prior on your priority list and and how do you go about attacking those well for me it's education 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 <laughs> it's it just when you focus on education then a lot of these other things take care of themselves yes we have the opioid crisis we have health care you know obesity and nutrition and those sorts of things you've got energy issues. Uh, we have a lot of issues in the state internet and uh, infrastructure uh, situations, but 
everything starts with an education. And if we don't have people reading at grade level by third grade, then they will fall further and further behind. And you don't have that workforce ready to, uh, to take on these jobs. We now have these companies coming into the state. And so this, you know, it may take several years, a decade or more uh, for the results to show, but we really have to solve that. We've got to get West Virginia up off the bottom of the states with regards to our education. So uh, I do look forward to May 15th, the day after the election, when we can start doing that kind of thinking and uh, putting the people and the programs into place. Uh, but we've got to get – I've got to get past May 14th first uh, to, to start down that path. And I'm really glad you asked that question because those are the type of questions that some of the other candidates aren't ready to to address while they're avoiding the debates is uh, they like to talk about themselves and that sort of thing. I want to talk about the people of West Virginia and solving our most basic needs, and that is a two-parent family, focus on family, focus on uh, getting rid of the woke and the social – agendas that are out there with trans and boys playing and girls sports. We need to put that aside. We're, we need to focus on the basics, and it all starts with education with Mac Warner. But as a practical matter, though, let's kind of put some meat on the bones here. How do you do that? Everybody, nobody's going to argue that education is not important, but we can't get the kids into the schools. we got a high tru truancy rate. We can't keep teachers from quitting. We have a shortage of them. We've got, you know, the, we all know what the problems are and the test scores are low. What strings do you pull? How do you actually get, how do you actually start fixing these problems? It, there's a, with a, with education, it's, there's a, it's like a three-legged stool. There's the teachers, we have to get respect, we have to get the pay, we have to get the insurance, we have to get those sorts of things, discipline. We have to give them the tools so they can teach in class rather than being trying to be the disciplinarians. Then it's the parents. We have to get the parents involved in schools, and then we always have to focus on the children. We can't lose sight of that. That's why we're for school choice and giving uh, people options when it comes to the education of their children. Now, I can talk about my specific children, how public schools were good for several of them, but I needed a private school to handle uh, one or the other. So uh, it's, it's an appreciation for all three of those. And then it's early childhood education. I'm talking – birth to three, then pre-kindergarten, and then kindergarten, and then the, what the legislature has done with the Success in Education Act, where we're putting assistance into the classrooms at grades one and two now, and next year it'll be one, two, and three. That's the right focus, and so it's working with the legislature, working with the teachers, working with the parents to get the right formulas, and then actually putting that as a priority when we start talking about the, the budget. It really drives me up a wall when I hear about these surplus, surpluses that West Virginia has. But when our teachers are not being paid what the surrounding uh, states are paying their teachers, we have the issues, uh, a morale problem because of the PEIA situation. We just need to listen to the experts, make sure that we have qualified teachers in the classroom. We give them the skills so that if uh, there is a discipline problem, we can handle it right there at the school or – I've heard what you're doing out in the panhandle is perhaps even putting in a special uh, situation, a special school to handle the disciplinary problems. Those are the sorts of things we need to try, and if it's successful, take that throughout the state. So those are just some of my ideas on how to focus on education, working with the legislature, working with the teachers to uh, prioritize education. If flatline budgets have to go away and tax increases have to happen in order to fund this, are you okay with that? Well, I'm not in favor of tax increases. If you listen right now, they're talking about we have more tax increases or tax, uh, I'm sorry, uh, budget surpluses. And so we can do this without increasing taxes. It's a matter of prioritization and spending. You know, when, when it comes around to it, you either have a spending problem, you're spending too much, or, you know, like you said, raise taxes. And I'm not, I'm a Republican. I'm against raising taxes. I think we can do it by controlling spending. Mac, if I could jump in on that education topic, uh, are, are we top heavy in the state of West Virginia when it comes to our education system? In other words, we spend as much per student as many other states uh, across the nation, and yet it seems like maybe those dollars aren't getting to the teacher and into the classroom, but are in administration and other areas. I think you're hitting the nail on the head there. So that's certainly one of the areas that we're going to be looking at to uh, make sure that that is streamlined and focused where the money needs to be, and that's on the student in the classroom. Mac Warner is our guest here on the program. About a minute and a half 
Uh, remaining, Mac, if you could uh, use this as a mini campaign speech, so to speak, address our audience and let them know why they should vote for you for governor. Well, I'd like to start with this is a Republican primary that I'm running in. And so if you look at the Republican Party platform, I check every one of those boxes, education, less government, life, Second Amendment, national defense, a strong economy, a focus on God, family, traditional marriage. All of those things are right up my alley. And so with Mac Warner, you've got the candidate who is best qualified, who is competent, experienced. My life is one of selfless service. I'm a West Virginian. I'm from West Virginia as opposed to um, one of the other leading candidates. Um, I'm a team builder. My whole military experience has been one of leadership and working with people and not uh, self-promotion and that sort of thing. So if you look at the candidates in this race, I'm basically the adult in the room. I'm the only person who can pull this party together after the election. Right now, millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars are being spent in negative advertising and attacking one another. You're not seeing that coming from the Mac Warner camp. So it, I want to pull this party together, unify us, work with the legislature. I will live in the governor's mansion. I have a wonderful wife. We will work uh, together as the first couple for the state. We just love this state, and that's why I'm running for governor. That's why I ask for your support. The Eastern Panhandle has been good to me in previous elections, and I look forward to uh, having that kind of support in the upcoming May 14th primary. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to your audience. And thank you, Mac, and thank you for agreeing to attend our uh, forum April the 16th here in Martinsburg. And uh, final question for you, sir, is uh, when is the deadline to register to vote for this upcoming May 14th primary? May, April 23rd. April 23rd. Thank you, Mac. Thank you. Good to be with you all.